It's time, the ATM podcast then. Myself, Martin Devlin from the platform, Mark Watson alongside. I want to talk about the White Ferns. I want to talk about the Super Rugby launch and these new rules designed to speed up the game. They've been listening to the fans, say New Zealand Rugby. They've, they've been paying attention, so they say. Ireland, France, mate. What you made of that, Six Nations? Australia, India. And watching the Australians capitulate with the bat, it's one of the most glorious sights in sport. The All-Stars game, the Hellbergs. Apologise to me! Lots to talk about. Let's kick it off with the White Ferns, though. So disappointing. The one thing that I did appreciate out of all of this is at least the skipper comes out and says it was embarrassing because that's what it was. It was painful to watch. Where are we at with women's cricket? We talk a good game, don't we? We've got all the competitions. We say that we're doing this. We say we're doing that. When it comes to the world stage, they're like the football ferns, mate. What is wrong with them? Well, the reality is, mate, they're club athletes. The reality is there's not the depth there. We've got a left-wing media. We've got a group of people who are desperate for this whole thing called equality and equity. And we've tried to um, fast-track these athletes to the top. We've put media around them so that we should treat our women's cricketers and we should talk about them the same way we talk about Bolt and Salvi, the same way that we talk about Hadley and Crow. And it's laughable. It's laughable. And I think a lot of these athletes believe in the hype and believe they deserve this. But if you actually look at the sport and break it down, it's such a minority sport. It's still a sport that's so much in its infancy. And I'm talking about the women's side of the game in regards to depth that, you know, they're never going to live up to that billing. And I think... And I think a lot of these um, journalists who have been pushing this agenda have a lot to answer for. And I just don't know whether they can handle the so-called celebrity that they're automatically being given. Um, you know, I, I was staying at a hotel in Wellington recently and the, and the team were there and I think they were playing Bangladesh. And they looked like just a bunch of little school kids, to be honest. And I'm made to believe that they deserve to stand alongside of Lisa Carrington. They they should be there alongside of Lauren Boyle and some of our great women athletes in individual sports. And it's laughable. It's a joke, Martin. And it's got to stop. And you also go back, and I ask people to do this, go back and have a look at when they started getting paid and now they get the same match fees as the men. The moment they started getting paid, the women's performance has actually declined. And you can actually do Google that. Go and have a look about 217. Have a look at all the results since then, since the money's come in and the sense of entitlement. Actually, the results have gone backwards. There's no longer any adversity. There's no longer any desperation. They believe everything. They've got a political, um, they've got a really powerful political lobby group behind them. And I think all of it, I think all of it is part of the reason why we're failing. Um, you know, we've clearly got some talent, but when I see talent and we're not getting results off it, I bring it back to application or the lack of it. I can't disagree with any of that, and I think that it's a really rational, composed, calm way of actually assessing it. We've got one or two good players, one or two who that can actually hold a bat and, and stand on a world stage, and the rest are bit part-timers. But we're never, ever going to be allowed to be honest about that because the way that the mass media sport reports things these days, I mean, I'd still get absolutely eternally frustrated at Sky TV's promotion of the football ferns. You know, they've got matches this coming weekend. Like, we're meant to be interested. Like, they are a team that is quality. Like, they are a team that means something. They are a team that achieves something. It's just ridiculous. I mean, there's there's no context put to any of this, is there? The facts of the matter is, do you perform on the big stage? No. Have you performed on the big stage? No. I mean, then the, the, and, and look... Give them time. I'm all for that. But we don't seem to want to do that. We seem to say that now, because of the, the wokeness of the world that we live in, that they have to be given the same screen time, the same attention, the same yeah. everything else. I've just done a, a, an, an interview with a guy from um, an ad agency who's uh, put together a thing called Correct the Internet. And it's look, it's, to me, it's just you know an ad guy wanting to win a woke award. But it's actually, you know, his, his thing is saying, look, when you Google certain names, like who's the... The you know the 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 leading football goal scorer international football of all time. Well, it comes up Cristiano Ronaldo, and it should come up a woman from Canada. And I said, well, okay, that's fair enough. But who did she score against? What were the games? I mean, you know, what kind of competitions yeah. was she playing in? It's not yeah. equal. It's never been equal. No. And the other thing that I always have about this is why aren't women watching women's sport? We talk about this almost every week. And here's an ad guy trying to ram it down your throat that we should be this, we should be that, we should be that. Well, why isn't your ad agency? And I did ask him actually yeah. getting its clients to fund women's sport to sponsor women's sport to actually put their money into that why not i mean the answers are well, obvious aren't they the answers are obvious and simple because the the the, the quality's not there yet the spectators aren't there yet 
The actual interest is not there yet. It's a faux interest being pumped up by certain sections of the media and these sports themselves. Well, well, look, I'll come back to Sky Television. As I said, you know, as I've said a number of times over the last 12 months doing this with you, Martin, look at their share price. 22 cents or $2.20 will get you 10-odd shares. Now, this is a company that's got a responsibility to its shareholders, but all it has has become is a political body for women's rights. That's all it's become, mate. It's just a voice now for women's rights. They don't care whether it rates. We're just going to do the right thing. Look, uh, you know, I was talking to a friend the other day. We're talking about trying to get funding for certain television shows, and now it's almost impossible. You can have the best story in the world, but unless you tick every box and you're not white and you're not European, um, there's a good chance you'll get funding if you do tick all those other boxes. But they actually forget a good story will always override anything. If it's a good story, it'll tell it, it, you'll get your audience. And the reality is you can shove it down our throat all the while, but you're right, the standard women's football is, is not particularly desirable to watch. I mean, it is at the highest, highest level, but not here in New Zealand. The standard of women's cricket, it's unorthodox. It it, it looks like school kids. We've got limited time. We're not going to watch it. But we've been told we're not allowed to think like this, Martin. That's the problem. We're not allowed to think like this. Now, how dare you think like this? Um, But, yeah, and and here it is, Sky Television continuing to shove it down our throat. I mean, how much resource are they going to put into this women's alpaki super rugby, knowing that half the stars are not going to be anywhere? We're going to be made to believe that these guys deserve the same billing as the Crusaders, the same billing as the Blues, that the best women's rugby player should have the same profile as Roger Tuivasa Sheik, should have the same problem as um, Will Jordan. And it's just ridiculous. It's an absolute laughable joke and it's got to stop now take have a look a really good example of police 1070 used to be one of the great television shows you had that guy who fronted it and he'd stand up there and go these two thugs yeah yeah are on the run yeah these two losers need to be caught yeah and what did we do oh suddenly we decided that was a bit too harsh and maybe it was racial profiling rather than just telling the truth automatically had to be racial profiling wasn't a fair balance so what do they do is they bring some c-grade celebrity like a sam wallison they pc it all down it doesn't rate now after a year of change it's no longer rating therefore it no longer exists unbelievable martin and when are these people going to realize that the majority of the people are not into this mentality of wokeness why are we continually trying to appease two percent of the population why are they such and why have they become such a powerful body martin that's the bigger question here and it's affecting a lot of organizations and ultimately i think it's unfair on women's sport too i mean look at what we've done with women's rugby how are they going to live up to the hype and to some of the journalism that surrounded this World Cup win, you know, to the point where we may as well have been watching 23 Richie McCaws during that Women's Rugby World Cup. How are we going to live up to that hype? They can't live up to that hype, Martin. And when it all falls over, what are they going to do? They're going to point the finger at the middle-class white male sports fan for why aren't you watching? And I accuse Martin, What are we doing to get the two and a half million women watching? Where are the feminists every week watching this? These same journalists that build them all up. You could sit down and go, name the starting. Yeah, they wouldn't name. They wouldn't name. They wouldn't name. They wouldn't name. They couldn't name one of them. They wouldn't name. They wouldn't name. Look, and I'd also point the finger at the chairwoman of New Zealand rugby. You know, tell me who the who the Opiki sides are. Tell me who won it last year. You know, I look at the board of that organisation, Mark, and I look at it and I just think, do you, does it scream innovation? Does it scream progression? Does it scream proactive? Does it does it scream think on your feet? Does it say, does it scream fleet footed at you? Does it scream exciting at you? No, it doesn't. It doesn't tick any of those boxes, mate. All it does is no. tick the boxes that say, oh, there's a person from this demograph, this race, this culture, this colour, this blah. Look, you know, Super Rugby launched yesterday, and I know that obviously the weather in Auckland mean that they couldn't do the big rah rah, but the rah rah was a school in South. South Auckland. Australia launched theirs on the steps of the Opera House. You've got to look at everything about the sport at the moment. I look at the promo that's on TV at the moment with Ruby Tui fronting it for Super Rugby Opiki. I mean, honestly, mate, did they film that on a handheld camera? I mean, they couldn't be cheaper if they possibly tried. They they talk all the talk. They say the right words and things. But when it actually comes down to it, is this organisation that is in charge of our national game up to the changing nature of the face of society and what they actually need to do to energise, to reinvigorate, to actually re-engage with their public? The answer is no. I looked at that Indigenous All-Stars game on the weekend and I thought, why isn't Super Rugby doing this? Take the games back to where the people are. Give the people something to look forward to. Wouldn't it be better to have five to 10,000 in a ground that's absolutely jam-packed and rocking in a smaller place in New Zealand than, what, 25,000 yellow empty seats at, at, at the at, at the Caton and the echo of concrete from Eden Park? It's just the most basic, simple things that they can't seem to get right and they never get right. 
No, but you look at that board of New Zealand rugby and you're right. All it is is these high powered people that have all had these roles in some sort of business have all been on boards, but you know, they don't want to upset anybody. They know this is all about their own ego. It's all about their own CVs. But when it actually comes down to making the decision, they want, don't want to attach their name to it in case that decision backfires, in case they somehow get accused of something. So nothing gets done. There is no vision anymore. But as I said to you last week, Martin, in this woke society, and the way people are so heavily for critiqued for anybody in a position, they're so heavily for critiqued if they use slightly the wrong word or they imply something they're not, which they're not actually implying, but hey, we'll make it out like they were implying something else. Um, you know, it, it, does that mean now that no one, can, everyone's too afraid to empower themselves, everybody's too afraid to make a decision, everybody's, too, you know, afraid to be ruthless? They know what needs to be done, but they're just not sure how to do it in this environment. And look, I, I look through that board of New Zealand rugby, there's a couple who you could say, look, understand the essence of the game, understand the product at every level, but most of them don't. And it all just comes down, they're all business people, and you know what business is all about. It's all about the bottom line. They don't understand the intangibles, and they don't listen to the fan. And I think, you know, and then, you, as I said, you've got a political body like Sky Television, that's all they are. They're a political body for women's rights now uh, and for the PC, uh, you know, and, and they're, work, they're working in cohesion and the people that are ultimately missing out of the fans, but ultimately the damage has been done to the game. And at what point, at what point, in three or four years' time, are we going to be sitting down and we're going to hear about them saying, oh, you know, we got a whole group of people together and we sat them down in a room and we asked them what's wrong with the game and we've got some really good information that's come from it. Now we're going to go away and work on it. It's like, mate, people have been saying it for five years, but people have been saying it for 10 years, but they still just don't seem to get it, Martin. All right, let's look then at a couple of other quick topics before we go. Ireland, France, how impressed with you were with the Irish? Yeah, very good. Look, I think both sides in that game are miles ahead of the All Blacks, to be honest. Miles ahead. For the first time in a long time, Martin, the Northern Hemisphere is well ahead of the Southern Hemisphere when it comes to the game of rugby. Um, and I could see both of those sides good enough to win the Rugby World Cup. I think Ireland will be better for having failed in 2019 when they went in as pre-tournament favourites and maybe couldn't deal with that. I think they will deal with it now. And I think New Zealand rugby should be deeply concerned that, um, you know, potentially we could play Ireland in a quarterfinal. Um, even if we had to end up playing Scotland in a quarterfinal, I think we're in a, I think we're in a bit of trouble. Um, and look well done to the Northern Hemisphere. They've been very smart in taking a lot of our intellectual property when it comes to coaching. And I think that's now starting to pay dividends. And it just goes back to my point. A New Zealand rugby organisation who are still seriously considering trying to retain Bowden Barrett beyond 2024, but again, still more than happy for all our coaches to go overseas. It's just, it's just stupidity, and it's dumb, and it's going to come back and bite us. Apologise to me! One of the greatest pleasures ever in sport is watching the England rugby team lose for me, to watch Liverpool lose, and also to watch the Australian cricket team capitulate. I know you won't agree with one of those three, but watching the Aussie batsmen just be fuddled, bemused, bewildered at that spin bowling coming at them in India, it's glorious to watch, isn't it? Are they overthinking it? Are they trying too hard? I mean, is it that difficult what they're actually asking themselves to do? Well, they got the wrong captain in Cummins. Um, Smith should be their captain, rightly or wrongly. Uh, you can't have a fast bowler captain inside. He's trying to be too nice. He's not ruthless enough. Uh, look, they've never played well overseas Australia. They're just bully boys. I mean, if you listen to their commentary team over summer, there's not a greater side and Cummins and, you know, and Mitchell Stark. I mean, the great fast bowling duo and their batsman, Lavajane, and all of this nonsense that we do here. Um, and then they go to India and get absolutely destroyed. The irony is that they started, you know, the media started questioning India around ball tempering, which, look, there's probably some merit in it, but isn't, isn't it ironic that the Australians are accusing another nation of ball yeah. tempering? Uh, look, David Warner, I mean, I think his time's up. Uh, the most intriguing, one of the most intriguing things in sport this year will be this Ashes series. And I, I'm just hoping that Australia go over there and get absolutely thumped by the English, absolutely thumped. Because, yeah, I mean, their arrogance, uh, the way they just conduct themselves, um, it's, yeah, like everybody just needs to be humbled. And there's not a team in the world that I like to see more humbled than this Australian side. And like you, Martin, I took great pleasure in it, great pleasure in it. Uh, but also just highlights, too, the importance of a good spinner. And um, maybe that's still something that New Zealand need to, um, you know, still need to take out of some of these series. Apologise to me! 
Finally, the Hellbergs are tonight, mate. The Hellbergs are always contentious, aren't they? And we're not going to go through every single one of the categories, but I kind of think that most of them do pick themselves. Um, overall, though, when you're trying to differentiate, and I think, you know, Sportsman of the Year to me is a good category to look at because you've got a squash guy there, Paul Cole, who overachieves. You've got Aaron Gates, who won three gold medals in cycling at the Commonwealth Games. Nico Porteous wins a gold at the Winter Olympics. Uh, Dylan Schmidt achieve, overachieves in the trampoline. He gets a bronze, or he gets on the podium. Shane Van Gisbergen in supercars. I mean, how do you actually compare apples and oranges here? And I think the only the only divider to me has got to be somebody that actually does it at a world championship. And I'm not talking about cycling and rowing who have one every second week. I'm talking about one every four years, like a World Cup or an Olympics or something like that. And I think Nico Porteous has to win that. Same as Zoe sadowski sinnott has got to win it. And I think overall... That one of those two, and I'd say Zoe, because of the fact she's won two medals there, has to win, to me, the Supreme. I, I don't believe it'll be anything other than a Black Ferns benefit tonight, and that is because of the media hype that is around it and 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 the, and the promotion of that where, compared to some of these other sports, which is going to be very disappointing. I'm not taking anything away from their achievement. They won the Rugby World Cup. Good on them. There were 12 teams, and of those 12 teams, three of them could actually play rugby. But hell... You know, this this awards always ends up in a bun fight, doesn't it, amongst us kind of people who sit there and debate continuously whether they should have won or they should have won. Oh, look, if the Black Ferns win this overall award, it's an absolute and utter joke. I mean, I'll go back to my argument around the cricket. I mean, it's still a minority sport. There's still not the depth in it. There's only three countries that could have won it. We were playing at home, incredibly well-resourced compared to, say, a lot of these other athletes. As Zoe Sadowski said, it doesn't win it. it, it it's an absolute disgrace. I mean... How many Winter Olympic medals have we won? Not a lot. Why? Because it's so damn hard, Martin. Mm. And, you know, she becomes the first New Zealand athlete to ever win Olympic Games gold. She backs it up with a silver. Nico Porteous' game on the men's side. Um, but, you know, I, I still a big believer that Stephen Adams somehow needs to be recognised in this. I mean, this is a guy in the starting team of a major NBA team. How do you measure his success? How well, do you yeah, measure, how do you measure, how do you measure Chris you Wood? How do you measure Chris you're, Wood playing you're, Premier you're, League? It's the same argument, isn't it? Serious, how do you measure that? You know, so... How do you how do you how do, how do how do you how do you measure these guys that that end up on a, a Tour de France team and become the workhorse on that? How do you how do you qualify that? I mean, you know, it's it's almost well, an impossible you do that, category. You do that, but you you do that, Martin, by having a judging panel that actually do some due diligence. But these people trying to tell me that Ruby Tui stands alongside of Stephen Adams, it's laughable, absolutely laughable. It's an absolute joke. Um, and so, how do we measure all that? Oh yeah, oh, oh, look, they came out. You know, even when like there was announced the sporting highlights of the year which the public get to the public get to vote on you know when stuff announced it what did they have the video of the women's rugby world cup what did they have photos of the women's rugby world cups so automatically they're pushing you in a certain direction aren't you they're not reminding you of the 10 wickets that Ajaz patel took in india they're not reminding you of our gates achievements at the commonwealth games they're just pushing their female agenda again they're pushing their women's rugby television new zealand did the same thing so it's not a level playing field before we even start um, and, 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 you know, they talk about equity, they talk about balance. Well, if you want equity and balance, then be true to yourself and actually go out there and do people like, you know, don't do a disservice to people like the Zoe Sadowski sin. It's actually do your damn homework on this stuff rather than just going down that sort of popularity contest mentality, uh, which unfortunately for too long has been a negative when it comes to the overall results of the Halberg Awards. So, yeah, but, but, you know, people, people go, oh, we can't, we can't give it to Lisa Carrington because she won last year and she wins every year. Do you think that Swiss criticised Roger Federer winning every year? Do you think the US criticised Tiger Woods winning every year? It doesn't make it any easier. It doesn't, it doesn't say that it's easy. What it actually says is just how exceptional, how remarkable she is. And I'll say this, you take any one of those black ferns, Lisa Carrington would look at what they do in training and laugh, would laugh. Those girls would not last an hour in the world of kayak training and what's actually required, Martin. And this is where we've actually got to start doing some due diligence. But also just look at these sports globally. Globally. How big are they actually on a global scale? Not not Lemon and Pyra, not world famous in New Zealand. Devlin. That is a disgusting act. The Platform.